In the last part of our series, we got from the more primitive Lepidopteran groups to the Glossata. And as we go on, we'll see that we are slowly shaving away the order Lepidoptera. Um, about 99% of described Lepidopterans are within the Glossata, and the group we're going to get to next has about 98% of Lepidopterans. But um, before we get to the Heteroneura, which includes the Detrisian and Monotrisian groups, we have to go to a group called the Exoporia. Now, the Exoporia have a um, very indistinct genital um, structure, especially in females, where it's simply a tube in which sperm is inserted. There's not any major organization. These are more primitive groups of Lepidopterans that, with the exception of one family, have only a few extant members in some remote regions of the world. Um, and it's probably a coincidence that some of these more primitive groups only have a few members still representing them. And we are starting with the most primitive um, taxa as we move down the line. So my color coding has changed a little bit. You remember my classical, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to go from green to green, and the black was just the side stuff that we quickly touch upon. But you can see a couple of different colors. So we're eventually going to get to here, but first we have to get through the yellow, then we're going to jump to the red. So after we get to these guys, which is going to take a few seconds because it's not very much, we're going to this group. And so within the Exoporia, we have two major superfamilies, the Nensarcheroidea and the Hepaloidea. Now, in the Hepaloidea, we have a whole bunch of different things, but in our superfamily Nensarcheroidea, we only have one family, Mensarcheoidae, and one genus, Mensarchaea. This genus has about a dozen or so species, um, nine of which are listed, and a few that have not been fully described. They are a primitive group of moths found only in New Zealand. They have this general nondescript form to them um, with a little bit of color, but um, it's nothing nearly as large or spectacular as what we see. Now, because they're in the Glossata, they have the proboscis. Um, this is the superfamily within the Exoporia that has functioning mouth parts. The next group we get into does not have functioning mouth parts. Um, like I said before, it is more parsimonious to assume in evolution that a trait is lost during several different um, lineage divergences than um, the trait just independently evolves. The same trait comes about multiple times. Um, and as we get further into this, we're going to see a mixed match of feeding and non-feeding um, species in different genera. And some families will have a mix of feeding and non-feeding species that are just within different subfamilies. Anyway, um, they have a very primitive, fringy, small-winged um, form. Um, what we're going to get into next video um, is the heteroneuria have um, forewing and hindwing differences. Now, the coloration of the forming and hindwing are different here, but the shape is exactly the same. Um, this is a feature of the more primitive moth species. They don't have a difference in the forming and hindwing shape. And in some of the larger, more advanced Lepidopterans, having a different shape to your hindwing is advantageous. Um, but we'll get into that later. If we go back, we have within the Exoporia our family, the Hepioloidea. The Hepioloidea has five different families, two of which are represented only by a single species. We have the Anamoceridae, which has Anamosis um, hylicoetis, which is this primitive African moth here, um, which looks very similar to Neothora choloides, which is in the Neotheoridae. We also have the Prototheoridae and the Paleocetidae, which we're about to get into. Um, within the Prototheoridae, we have about 11 species, all found in Africa, that have this general body plan. Again, they're poorly described. They're very small, rare, difficult to find moths that people don't generally find that exciting. Um, representative specimens from some of these groups are great for um, obtaining molecular evidence for... Um, relationships within the Lepidopterans, but that's about it. They don't have any um, major significance, 
the larvae of all the members of this group Exoporia are very poorly known and they probably all feed upon live or rotting wood and do not appear um, outside of that. Not to say that this is the only group of Lepidopterans that has this feeding guild, but it's the major one. We also have the slightly larger Paleocidae. It has four genera, um, one genus, Ogigoises, has four species. Um, I couldn't find a picture of all Luanagensis, but I found a picture of Ogirata, Ovasikii, and Ocaliginosa. Um, you can see these two look fairly similar. This guy seems to have a little bit more color to him. Um, they are part of one group. Then you have the genus Genustes, which just has Genustes lutata. Um, this is another primitive moth. These moths are found all over Africa and Asia. This moth, I believe, is just found in Africa. And then we have species that are very poorly described or photographed. Um, Paleosis scholastica and Oshros coronata. And then finally, we have our Hepialidae. Um, Hepialidae is a very large group of moths. It's probably the most well studied in this group. And as you may recall from our huge phylogenetic tree, this was the family that really just represented the entirety of the um, Exoporia because it's the largest. There are 500 plus Hepialid species out there. Um, the majority of them are found in Australia. However, there are many species that are found in South America, as well as a small group, a few dozen species that are found in North America, not in New England, oddly enough. They are either found in the deep south, um, around the Gulf and Arizona area, or um, in Canada. Um, and that's the scoop on our hepialids. Um, again, I did not list genera and species for this group just because they are very large. As we get on in this series and start to look at larger superfamilies and larger families, um, I will only go to the um, family level, perhaps the subfamily level in most cases, just because of how much time it would take to go through every last genus. Remember, about 10 to 11 percent of life on Earth is a lepidopteran. So in our next series, we're going to finally get to our heteroneura and hopefully to the um, dystrian group, which contains, again, about 98% of described lepidopterans.